This episode is sponsored by Lino, the world's largest independent cloud computing provider. Stick around, I'll tell you, you can get $100 in credit on a new Linode account. Hey there, my name's Gary Sims, and this is Gary Explains. Now, the Raspberry Pi Foundation have done something quite strange. They've released something that looks more like a computer rather than a small circuit board. This is the Raspberry Pi 400. So if you wanna find out more, please let me explain. Okay, so until now, the Raspberry Pi Foundation has made its uh, mark on the world by releasing these small single board computers. You don't get anything other than just a circuit board. It's got lots of connectors on it, including Ethernet and USB, Wi-Fi, camera connectors, 40 pins for GPIO. And there's a whole range of these boards. They started with the original Raspberry Pi, and then we had the Raspberry Pi 2, the Raspberry Pi 3, the Raspberry Pi 4. Somewhere along the way there, we also had the Raspberry Pi Zero, which is a much, much tinier, tiny, tiny little board. And that's how the Raspberry Pi Foundation has become known. And it's been a phenomenal success. Millions and millions of units have been sold and they are relatively cheap. You can buy the kind of the base board, just, you know, two gigabytes of RAM for the Raspberry Pi 4 for around $35 or the equivalent uh, in your region. And then of course, they have also been getting better and more powerful. So the latest Raspberry Pi 4 can come with up to eight gigabytes of RAM. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation is known for these boards, but now it's released this, a kind of a computer in a keyboard. So why? Why has it released this? Well, let's answer that question before we look at what it is. So the why is quite simple. The whole reason the Raspberry Pi Foundation exists is that Eben Upton and others uh, around him saw that there was a direct correlation between the amount of uh, hobbyist computing that went on at home and the amount of people that went in to study computer science. So in the 80s and 90s, you had the home computer revolution. That's when you first started to see relatively cheap computer equipment coming into the home that you could buy in a normal department store, and they were relatively cheap. And so you're looking at things like the Commodore 64, the VIC-20, the BBC Model B, the Sinclair ZX Spectrum, all these kind of computers. And then the follow-ons after those, you had the Amiga, you had the Atari ST, and there's a whole history around these kind of 8-bit and 16-bit computers computers. Eventually that morphed into kind of the PC era and then of course after that we've got consoles and tablets and smartphones and that's kind of the way things went. And what has been observed is that when there was this kind of hobbyist computing available, when you had things like the BBC Model B or the Sinclair Spectrum uh, in uh, kind of the homes of teenagers, then there was a direct correlation that a few years later they would go to university and study some kind of engineering or computer science related courses. In fact, that's how it also happened to me. I started with a ZX80, a Spectrum Sinclair ZX80, then I had a ZX81, then I had a Spectrum, then I had an Atari ST, and then, a re and then ultimately I went to university to study computer science. Now, once these home computing devices kind of disappeared and we had the kind of the PC era and then kind of the game console era, the number of people studying computer science went down. So the Raspberry Pi Foundation is based on the idea that if we can get these kind of devices in the home again, then people will start tinkering, building circuits, controlling robots, making motors, sensors, writing JavaScript, writing Python, writing C programs, and they can do it all on these very, very simple boards that are you know, very relatively cheap. You just plug them into a keyboard, mouse, monitor, and so on, and you're up and running. Now, I mentioned devices like the Commodore 64, the BBC Model B, the, uh, the ZX Spectrum. Now, if you look at one of these, you can see this is a kind of a modern day equivalent to one of those. They were all basically plastic boxes with a keyboard built into them and then some ports at the back you then connect to. At the time it was your television, okay? And that's how it worked. And this is the modern equivalent of one of those. And that's why they've announced it. They wanted to kind of recreate that sort of home hobbyist idea of a computer that there was in the 80s and 90s, and then they kind of made it available today for someone just to pick up. It's quite rope, it's different to a circuit board. You know, it's plastic, it, you can use it, you can just kind of stick it in and you can put it to one side and you're not worrying about seeing all these wires and everything, you know, and circuit capacitors and things sticking up from the circuit. It's like a proper consumer device. And that's why the Raspberry Pi 400 exists. Now, whether that's a good idea or not, well, that's up to you to decide. So now let me tell you a bit about the thing itself. 
So as you can see, it's a keyboard with a Raspberry Pi inside of it in a plastic housing. And then you've got connectors on the back for Ethernet and USB and for the HDMI. And there's also the GPIO pins and a slot for the SD card to go in so you can boot up your operating system. Now inside, what's interesting, I took mine apart and it's quite easy to take apart. You just pry is open the plastic separating them out and then inside you won't find a raspberry pi 4 what you actually find is a special circuit board that's been designed for the raspberry pi 400 it's based on the idea of the raspberry pi 4 it's got a very very similar processor and it's got four gigabytes of ram but there are things that are different for example there's no uh, camera uh, connector there so you can't stick in a raspberry pi camera that you would be able to do on one of the smaller boards however it does rain maintain other features like the GPIO pins and of course uh, the USB ports and the Ethernet port and all that kind of stuff. This episode is sponsored by Linode, the largest independent cloud computing provider. Whether you're an experienced developer, user or just starting out, you can build on Linode. Start from scratch and fully customize your server for any application or use their one-click apps to deploy game servers, websites, personal VPNs and much more. Whether you just need a basic website for your portfolio or a beefy GPU instance for AI, scientific computing and computer graphics projects, Linode has the flexibility and the scalability to meet your needs. If you run into any trouble during setup, Linode comes with amazing 24-7 customer support by phone or ticket, along with hundreds of guides and tutorials to help you get started. Sign up today at linode.com slash Gary Explains and get $100 in credit on your new Linode account. The link is in the description. Also, what's interesting is that this is the big metal thing in the middle of the uh, plastic box here, and that's got three purposes. One, it does give some weight. Obviously, when you're typing and things, you don't want this thing to slide about because it's so lightweight. It does give it some weight. It also gives it some rigidity so that it's not just plastic that you could easily snap in half. And also, it acts as a huge heat sink, which means that this uh, processor in here is actually clocked at 1.8 gigahertz compared to the 1.4 gigahertz that you would get with a normal Raspberry Pi 4. Now, as I said, because it's not a Raspberry Pi inside of just a keyboard attachment, then basically you do need special versions of the software for the Raspberry Pi 400. So for example, obviously Raspberry Pi OS just supports it from the day it was launched, that's not a problem. But if you're looking at alternative operating, let's say like uh, Ubuntu, then you can't use an older version of Ubuntu. You have to use a more modern one because they have been released for the Raspberry Pi 400. And if you use the Raspberry Pi imaging tool, and I have a video about that here on this channel, link in the description, then you can just download the latest version and you can see in the description there it says which version it's compatible for and you want to see one that actually says for the 400 and then you'll be able to install it however most of the key stuff are already being ported over to the 400 including retro pi and the media centers and raspbian or raspberry pi os ubuntu and so on so let's just talk a little bit about the GPIO pins. Obviously one of the big things about the Raspberry Pi is that you can build electrical circuits starting with just a simple LED that you flash on and off. And there are a whole bunch of hats which kind of can sit on top of a Raspberry Pi that use the same form factor. They can plug into the pins there and you can do all manner of things, including for example, here is an example of a small LED uh, hat that you can get. Now they still work exactly the same on the Raspberry Pi 400, but again, because of the uh, design of it, this is now sticking out the back. So you have to plug it into the back. And this again is very reminiscent of what you would get back in the home computer age, the Commodores and the Sinclairs and the BBC Model Bs, because this expansion port, something you could plug into the back and then it could talk to the main computer and you can kind of build interesting things. And there are a whole bunch of interesting third party add-ons that were created for all of those individual computers. And it's the same idea here. You kind of got this socket, you can plug in an expansion port and it does work. Of course, the orientation is different to what it is on a Raspberry Pi four so here's an example of my uh, led screen there of course when i'm running the clock it's upside down because that's the way the orientation is of course you can use it for all you know normal stuff by using kind of a ribbon cable as a way of doing a breakout and then putting it onto a breadboard and then you can kind of design whatever circuits you want so there are solutions to these things so you have to understand that this is slightly different to what you'd get in a normal raspberry pi now, a couple of things to mention about the keyboard. As you can see, it's a very compact keyboard. It's not as big as you get for, let's say, a desktop PC. 
And there are a couple of things to note. One is that, for example, page up, page down, uh, home and end are here on the cursor keys and you have to press the function key at the same time. Works fine, very easy to get used to, but there aren't separate keys for those. Same with the number pad, there's not a separate number pad. You have to press the function key here to get the number pad working or use the num lock key. But probably the most important thing, other than the Raspberry Pi key, which of course is replacing what would be a Windows key on a desktop or maybe the command key on, on a Mac. Okay, you press that, of course you get the, the, the menu comes up, is that this F10 is actually a power key. So if you press function F10, you can actually shut down the machine and if you press it when it's off, then it'll actually boot it up. So first time we've actually got a Raspberry Pi with an on-off switch, which is absolutely great. Now the Raspberry Pi 400 comes in two varieties. You can just buy the keyboard as I've shown you like that. No power supply, no mouse, or nothing. You just buy it, get that, and then you have to provide everything else. Or you can buy it as a kit where you get the power supply, you get the mouse, you get the HDMI cable, and you also get the SD card with Raspberry Pi OS already on it, and you get a nice book. And the book itself is very interesting, very colorful, very informative. Here you're gonna have all the information you need about building circuits, programming in JavaScript, programming in Python. It's all covered in here. And of course, this is very reminiscent of what you'd get in again in the days of the home computer revolution. Each of those computers I mentioned would come with a fairly thick book that would teach you the basics. Then of basic language programming today would use Python or JavaScript. Uh, and this is all covered in a book like this. So it's actually a pretty good kit when you look at it from that point of view. In fact, if you were to buy one of these, because of the pricing, in fact, considering you get the power supply, the HDMI cable, the SD card and the book and a mouse, actually the kit version is very, very reasonably priced. I think it's about $100 or 100 euros compared to let's say uh, $69, I think it is, or 69 euros, 70 euros for just the keyboard version. So those extra $30, 30 euros do seem to get you, it's worth getting that, because then you're up and running, all you literally need is a monitor or a TV with a HDMI port and you're absolutely up and running. Now the question always comes, is this a viable desktop replacement? As I said, for the Raspberry Pi 4, it's a huge improvement over the Raspberry Pi 3. The processor is much, much more powerful. Having four gigabytes of RAM in the case of the Raspberry Pi 400 makes it very, very usable. However, if you open more than two or three tabs inside of the web browser, if you're talking about desktop replacement in that you want, I mean, literally my desktop, I've got three monitors and like, 25, 50 tabs open sometimes. I mean, just depends on your usage. But if you are looking for simple usage, then yes, it will work. If you're looking for productivity day to day, then you are gonna struggle with using it. However, it is a workable solution, but you're gonna end up being a bit frustrated. However, as a computer for learning, programming, Python, JavaScript, circuits, all that kind of stuff, and then also being able to click onto a YouTube video and watch it, then that's gonna be absolutely fine. Talking of YouTube videos, I just remembered that the audio, there's no audio out on this, so you can't plug in headphones, you can't plug in external speaker, only comes with the HDMI, so you have to make sure that your TV or monitor certainly has got audio on it. I've got the uh, LaPau HDMI monitor that I'm using here, and I've got a video about that description, uh, link in the description below, and that's got audio built in, speakers built into it, so the audio worked absolutely without any problem at all here on my setup. Okay, so that's about it. So my name's Gary Sim, this is Gary Explains. I really hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do give it a thumbs up. Now, a quick thing, some people have been writing in the comments like astounded, like, oh, a new video from Gary, and actually it, I might have published 10 videos. It's because it seems that you, we're all at the mercy of the YouTube uh, algorithm for what it recommends you. So if you wanna make sure you know what videos I'm posting, subscribe to the channel, and that way you're not at the mercy of getting the right notification from YouTube. You'll know what's coming out because you're subscribed to the channel. Okay, that's it. I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.